So our next speaker is Kelsey Miller. Kelsey came to the MAS NBC program after eight years in her role as executive director of Canada's National Science Festival, Science Rendezvous. Over her tenure with Science Rendezvous, Kelsey founded several program initiatives, including the Canada-wide Experiment, the Science Chase, an obstacle course of science challenges, and the Indigenous Science Program, all of which are now operated in partnership with the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada. During her career transition to marine conservation, Kelsey also spent several months working in the Philippines with the UN Environmental Program's Green Fins Initiative, where she developed the program's cross-cultural outreach platform for environmentally sustainable diving and snorkeling practices still in use today. So when Kelsey was thinking about what she wanted to do for her capstone project, she was incredibly thoughtful and deliberate in what she wanted to focus on. Um, she really was here to uh, hone in on her, her scientific skills. She really wanted to get a lot of experience here at Scripps in science, including hands-on applied experience. So she knew she wanted to do science. It seemed that she wanted to also integrate technology and I know that it was also really important to her to have a project that supported and empowered local coastal communities, especially, and in particular, indigenous communities. Um, but she wanted to do it in a way that had a lot of integrity and was really respectful of these communities. And you know, marrying those three potentially divergent and disparate concepts in a single project is, is not as simple as it sounds, especially if you do want to do it in a way that is really respectful and lifts up these coastal communities. So I am really proud to say that Kelsey did find a path forward, and she was able to sort of marry all of those concepts into a single project. And I hope she's really happy with the way that it came out, because I think it's just excellent and innovative and inspiring. So welcome, Kelsey Miller. I am happy with it. <laughs> we'll see if you are. <laughs> so tide pools have captivated human imagination and creativity since forever. At the land-sea interface, they're one of the most accessible marine environments. And for most of us, well, at least for me, they were my first porthole through which I was able to see the amazing underwater world. And that was it. I was hooked. Um, they're also, in California in particular, an iconic seascape and an incredibly important cultural resource for the state's indigenous peoples. The Rocky Intertidal is characterized by strict biological zonation, resulting from varying physiological tolerances to physical factors like immersion, time out of water, and um, intense competition. This and the fact that globally, uh, the vast majority of rocky intertidal habitats are backed by steep sea cliffs makes them one of the most vulnerable ecosystems to long-term climactic change, as in sea level rise. What's not known still is how the important habitat forming organisms within the rocky intertidal, like mussels and turf algae, will respond uh, to short term variability within long term climatic change, and if this can be used as sensitivity indicators for improved understanding of long term sea level rise impacts. So we've probably, um, most of us, especially here, uh, have at some point seen something like this, which is a long-term trend projection of sea level rise, uh, because sea level rise is a well-documented and observed trend. But what's actually interesting to me are the squiggles. Um, actual sea level at any given geographical area or point in time is highly variable. It's a noisy long-term trend. Uh, it, and there's very little empirical evidence for how intertidal organisms respond to this short-term variability. And as I said, if that can be used to help improve long-term predictions. 
So there was one study um, out of the Hopkins Marine Station in Monterey Bay that was able to establish a long enough term record of biological response to sea level rise, and uh, which is based essentially on geo-referenced historical photographs from 1947 to 2005, which tracks the rise of the upper limit of Endocladia americata, which is a red seaweed uh, commonly known as sea moss. And it has a, a particularly distinct boundary, which can be easily and accurately identified even in these grainy photos. So what you're looking at here, these uh, yellow arrows actually indicate the exact same place on the rock face and illustrate a large change in that upper limit. So the study found that while the elevation of Endocladia americata essentially tracked uh, the sea level trend for a long time, it suddenly broke from this pattern and abruptly jumped 30 centimeters within a very short period. This got my wheels turning because if the gradualist model continues to dominate coastal management plans as it currently does, uh, meaning that we are really only managing right now for assumed very small biological response to long-term climate change, uh, small incremental changes over long periods of time, which means that this kind of abrupt, precipitous, and nonlinear response could undermine our ability to make effective conservation and management decisions. So I designed my capstone in part to answer the following research questions. Does intertidal zonation of representative organisms change on short time scales? Do these potential short-term changes correspond with sea level variability and wave action trends over the same period? And can we use large area imaging approaches to track short-term and long-term biological response to changing oceanographic conditions? Large area imaging has been increasingly used in subtitle systems like our very own 100 Island Challenge that you would have heard my roommate talk about earlier in the day if y'all were here. Um, and, but it hasn't really been used extensively in the intertidal at all, and it has never been used to track short-term variability of intertidal organisms responding to um, climate change. So part of my capstone was also, oh, I didn't mean to click next. But anyway, part of my capstone was also testing the methodological feasibility of the application for this particular study and its transferability um, in working with coastal communities particularly indigenous coastal communities as our longest standing land and sea stewards. So to do this, um, I first began by resampling four uh, survey sites established in San Diego by the Smith Lab in 2017, one of which was Scripps Coastal Reserve, which is just literally just out front here, and three down just south of La Jolla uh, at Cabrillo National Monument. I then conducted uh, rigorous analysis of the mean tidal elevation change for representative organisms at the Scripps Coastal Reserve site. Um, finally, I established a new survey site in partnership with the Talua Daini Nation uh, in the northernmost marine protected area of California, the Pyramid Point State Marine Conservation Area. One of the limitations to establishing empirical evidence for biological response to long-term trends is kind of built into the conventional method of intertidal ecology itself, uh, which is usually conducted essentially in a race against the tidal schedule in using very small scale quadrats and point line transect surveys. The entire expanse of the intertidal is only actually available for rigorous study for a few hours per year at extreme low tides. And what we actually need to start making this kind of analysis are long-term data sets on large enough scales to be ecologically relevant. So what we do is pass a camera back and forth over the entire intertidal, a study area of about six meters by 30 meters. Um, and in pass the camera back and forth in a grid pattern, collecting continuous imagery every half second which yields around 12,000 photos per site. These photos are then stitched together, it's working, stitched together by a computer software to create this data-rich 3D habitat map. 
This is Cabrillo National Monument, Zone 1, uh, which was collected by the Smith Lab in 2017. This large area imaging approach is, enables us to capture the entire extent of the intertidal from the lowest low water line to beyond the splash zone for a truly ecosystem level analysis. For my particular study, I then used uh, an advanced imaging and analysis software developed right here on upper campus uh, at UCSD by Vid Petrovic and the Kuster Lab to virtually drop 90, and, well, actually 9,600 uh, stratified random points within the defined 30 meter by six meter study boundary here. Um, if you're thinking 9,600 points sounds like a lot, it is. I spent well over a week, all day, every day, using the raw images associated with each one of these points to identify the organism directly underneath, organism or substrate, whatever was directly underneath, as close as possible to species level. Something that is just not possible when you're scrambling around on your hands and knees trying to beat the incoming tide. The study plot and number of stratified random points were kept consistent between years for direct comparison and future replication. From each of these points, I then extracted latitude, longitude, and elevation information uh, in both years that enabled me to calculate the mean tidal elevation for each of these functional groups and compare the change over the two years. So as you can see from this graph, uh, that plots that difference. Uh, blue, dark blue is 2017 and light green is 2018. Uh, there was a general decrease in tidal elevation over this time frame. Of particular note, uh, our largest changes observed in green algae and surf grass, which actually went from a positive mean tidal elevation to a negative mean tidal elevation. In fact, the only functional groups that increased their tidal elevation between uh, 2017 and 2018 were chitons and small barnacles, acorn barnacles, which is interesting given that these are the two organisms that it is impossible to tell in this kind of image analysis whether what you're designating is alive or dead. So it's a potential methodological uh, limitation that we're continuing to develop and work out, but I think it's clear hmm, that uh, <laughs> I'm gonna speed up, that <laughs> given that they responded in a way that makes sense, as you can see from this uh, visualization of what happened to the mean sea level over the same period, it decreased. Also, visualization of what happened to the mean significant wave height over the same period, it decreased, which together means that the intertidal would have experienced less total runup or inundation. So essentially, organisms in 2017, or in 2018, that would have been at the same tidal elevation, would, would experience more time out of water than the previous year. So it makes sense that they then tracked down, tried to get closer to the water. So they're doing it, they're responding. Um, and even visually, you can see that Dyke Rock, which is Scripps Coastal Reserve, if all, you can all tide pull it with me after this if you want to. Uh, it, in 2017 was covered in ulva and other green algae that was essentially barren in 2018, which is a tidal elevation change in and of itself of over a meter. So essentially the capstone serves to prove that um, this method works for this kind of analysis and can uh, potentially be used to improve our understanding of long-term impacts as well. And basically bears further investigation. Uh, so next, I traveled north to Smith River, which is where the Talawa Deni are currently headquartered. Coastal indigenous nations have studied and managed uh, coastlines since time immemorial and are the most knowledgeable about these systems. The Talawa Deni have a deep cultural connection to their rocky intertidal and have been actively involved in traditional and scientific monitoring of their coastal resource, resources for many, many years. So one of the products of my capstone is actually the formation of a partnership framework with the Talawa Deni and faculty and students at Scripps Institute of Ocean Institution of Oceanography, um, the Tribal Intertidal Digital Ecological Surveys, the Tides Project. 
This partnership with the Talo Adeni puts cutting edge technology and research directly into the hands of our longest land and sea stewards, longest and most capable land and sea stewards, while creating a framework for knowledge exchange. While working with the natural resources staff of the Talawa Daini Nation, uh, this is Rosa and JTAC, uh, we were able to establish two survey sites in Pyramid Point Marine Conservation Area to test the application of the large area imaging approach in this very different terrain and tidal regime. Uh, I used this field trip uh, for field demonstrations of the method uh, and data collection and analysis using VizScore, which is that imaging and analysis software. And um, we also actually began to co-develop standard operating procedures, which will facilitate other interested tribes in participating in the TIDES project in the future to uh, get their hands on this and self-operate faster. So during this trip, I was also invited to present the project to the Talawa Daini Fishing Game Committee committee, and the TIDES project was actually so well received there that one of the tribal council members, this is Marvin in the red hat, the one you haven't seen before, uh, actually came out with us at 5.30 the next morning <laughs> to, to learn the, the method and actually help us collect the raw imagery that then produced this detailed habitat map. I will continue to analyze and develop this partnership and analysis of uh, this habitat, this particular habitat map with the natural resources staff in the coming months. And of note is one of the reasons that uh, Marvin and the natural resources staff are so excited about the TIDES partnership project is that uh, it's a low cost, easily transferable method with very high performing results that in combination with traditional knowledge of the intertidal over the long term will boost our and build all of our abilities to effectively and adaptively manage to changing climate conditions. So uh, in terms of future outlook and uh, next steps, the newly established TIDES project and partnership project, we are currently applying for funding with the natural resources staff uh, that will build their local capacity to sustain the project and expand to uh, work with additional coastal indigenous nations. And we're also co -develop, going planning to co-develop a training workshop, workshop that will um, enable us to expand to two additional sites in the next year. So on that note, as uh, American novelist John Steinbeck once said, there are good things to see in the tide pools and there are exciting and interesting thoughts to be generated from the seeing. With the advent of 3D imaging technology and the ability to take the rocky intertidal home with us for endless exploration, these words have never been more true. Thank you. <laughs> So I know I'm supposed to take questions now, but uh, I just want to give a quick thank you. There are so many people that helped me with this project, but these that I can't fit on a slide, but these are my MVPs. Um, thank you so much to Professor Jen Smith, who is my chair and mentor through the entire process, Sarah Giddings for being my sea level guru and countless number of amazing and exciting brainstorming sessions, and Clint, who spent so many hours with me, helping me in the field, in the lab, late nights, I can't even tell you. And not just me, I think he helped every single one of us with our capstones. Like, he's so generous with his time, it's, I don't know if he got any of his own work done. <laughs> so, uh, thank you so much. Um, also to uh, Megan, Rosa, and Jay Tuck for hosting me and being so generous with your time and, and digging the project and wanting to keep working with me. I can't wait to go back. And my parents who are here, um, my constant inspiration and the only reason I could have done half of what I've been able to do so far. And my grandparents who were literally my refuge in the sh poop storm when the sewer line under our house <laughs> broke earlier in the year. Thank you. Do we have time for questions or did I yeah, use it all? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I know, I explained it really well. <laughs> cool. <laughs> like, 
Sorry, do you make that call? I mean, sure. No questions?